Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and today we're driving a 1988 Callaway Twin Turbo Corvette. This is kind of an oddball car for the 80s because, in fact, you could order this from Chevrolet. You'll notice it has some different bodywork. These taillights look like a Ferrari 456. You say, I want a Corvette. The ZR1 has not come out yet, but I want a fast car. So you tick a box for $27,000. And then they send your car to Callaway in Old Lyme, Connecticut. They tear down the motor. It's a full engine out service. They give you a beefier bottom end with a forged crankshaft, a few other goodies, but they put on two turbos, a couple of intercoolers, and a four speed. Yes, it's a four speed. We're gonna get into that when we get into the car. You also get these Callaway magnesium wheels. We're still talking about magnesium wheels in 2021 with Porsche 911s, but my goodness, you could get them back in 1988. So what made this so special? It was the torque because it made 382 horsepower. Oof, let's see if we can get this thing up. But more importantly, it made over 550 pound feet of torque. So it was kind of a monster. Keep in mind, a Lamborghini Countach at the time was making 425 horsepower. There's almost no room under the hood of this thing. We've got two big intercoolers here. Turbos are snuck way down low and they've added some additional scavenge pumps to make sure that this thing is oiled. To keep it cool, you can tell they opened up this front end quite a bit. And this was the predecessor to the sledgehammer. The sledgehammer was the 255 mile an hour real monster that everybody knows about. But this was the one that you'd probably be buying in the 80s. You can hear the familiar ding of GM telling me that the key is in the ignition, but I wanna show you back here under the hatch first. Down here opens this glass hatch. It's a pretty thick piece of glass. So even though it looks like, oh my goodness, you're gonna break it. Nah, that's pretty strong. And I have a pillow back here. I'll explain the pillow in a minute. There's some very strange, quirky things about this car. And of course, fuel up back here. All right, when we jump in, Give a little toe tap to keep it clean. I can get the key out of the ignition only because it's in reverse. Just like that 1981 Pontiac Trans Am that I drove, it does have the reverse lockout. But you'll notice that this gear selector has a button on top with an OD. That's the old overdrive symbol because this is a four plus three overdrive system. You can go into overdrive in second, third, and fourth gear because this four speed manual gearbox is mated to essentially a two speed automatic gearbox behind it. So electronically, you can change into high and low in second, third, and fourth gear on the fly. Let's start it up. First, we're greeted with kind of an insane. And now let me explain the pillow. On the seats, there are buttons. There look like memory buttons. There's lumbar support. There's the, the back moving forward and backwards. I could not for the life of me figure out how to move the seat forward and backwards. And then I put my phone in this compartment and I found it. This is how you move the seats. It's totally crazy. It's also right where you move the mirrors. There's a plaque here that says this is number 55 of 400. I've been told that 400 was a very optimistic idea for how many cars they were going to build. And there's only somewhere in the neighborhood of 125 of these. And this one only has 22,800 miles on it. The roof is glass. You can take that off and turn it into kind of a Targa convertible type deal. But there's so much light coming into the cabin because the rear of the car is all glass. So right in front of me, I've got my LCD display. I can move my car them up and down like so. Very typical old school GM stuff. I've got my oil pressure digitally. Doesn't really help me. <laughs> Coolant temperature, digital. Don't know how much I trust that, but it doesn't overheat, so we're good to go there. And then, of course, we have kind of these odd tack and speedos that give me both static readouts and a gauge, a graph, but the graph is a little delayed. It's not the most helpful thing in the world, but the most important gauge, the coolest gauge in this is the Callaway boost gauge to tell me how much pressure is going into those turbos. So enough chit chat, let's go for a drive. This is a nice place to be, and it's very odd to drive a twin-turbo vet kind of from the factory. I mean, this had a warranty. 
it's got such a different character than I'm used to in these cars. Not that I really have driven a lot of C4 Corvettes, but you know, I know my way around a Corvette. This is not, this is not typical. Nice and easy to rev match downshift. Great rumble from this thing. You can hear those turbos just whoosh into boost. Oh, that is sketchy. No, thank you. Roll this window down, roll into it just a little bit. It's great to feel the progressive and linear boost come in. But what's interesting is because you still have a 5.7 liter V8 behind it, it's not like it's not like you don't have any low end torque. A lot of a lot of like, you know, small displacement engines in the 80s had big turbo lag because, you know, there wasn't anything really to be provided by the engine itself. But here, you're still working with a pretty beefy V8. So, although there's absolutely turbo lag, there's torque whenever you want it. Hear a little blow off valve sound there as well. What a hoot, man. So over the bumps, you start to get a feel for 1980s GM build quality. And you know, there's some squeaks and rattles, but this is actually an incredibly good shape. But what's interesting is despite any squeaks or rattles or things you hear, the chassis is actually just amazing to drive. This is so tight. I'm genuinely surprised. So if you were buying this and you were like, yeah, let's go have a party. Let's go, let's go have some fun out in some back roads. You would not be disappointed with this thing. So let me show you what this overdrive is like. We're cruising along 1900 RPM. There it is, down to 1600 RPM. That's kind of how this whole thing works. It's very simple. It's just a big clunk into a you know a power glide transmission and it's still engaged i went down a third i can turn it off from third and there it is i've been told you're not supposed to engage this at wide open throttle i'm not sure why you ever would Just like they still are today, in 1988, Chevy was competing with supercars, expensive cars. They were trying to show up that, hey, look at what we can do. We can have more power and performance than Ferrari, Lamborghini, Porsche. And at the time, this was like a serious monster. I mean, this is 550 pound-feet of torque, 565 actually, I think. But I, I, who's to say? I don't, I don't know what this is. Honestly, these cars are all a little odd to me because I've tried to do some research on this. Some of the earlier cars I noticed didn't have the appearance package. It had the same quad taillights that the standard C4 had, and some didn't have the uh, the front bumper either. So I don't fully understand how that all worked or what you could order if it was year specific. But I love the idea that there were these kind of oddball tuning companies that got a shot at building like legitimate cars for mass production. They weren't just tuners. I mean, these actually had warranties. <laughs> you get the tail to upset a little bit on it too. I mean, you gotta remember, this is a single leaf spring in the back. Super easy to rev match downshift as well. This is actually a very fun, I was, I'm not gonna lie, I was expecting this to just be a big lump. A big lump that someone spent way too much money on in the 1980s, but. Joke's on me, because this is really fun. And these brakes, they're actually pretty legit. Everything about this car is very easy to drive in 2021. Steering's really spot on. I mean, this must have been just outrageously impressive. Whoever got a hold of one of these in 1988, I would have been losing my mind. This gearbox is great because it's pretty precise, super easy to hit your gate, but it's also got enough feel to it. it you know, it's funny, I, if I had to compare it to like a modern gearbox, like something that maybe you'd be more familiar with, it's kind of like if you took a 
muscle car and then mated it with a Lotus Elise, like that Toyota gearbox, that Toyota six speed. Turning radius, not the most impressive thing in the world. It needs some space. And let's see, when we come out of this, we're gonna to need to be really cautious of this front lip because the nose is low and long and we don't wanna scratch. There we go, we're out. Super tactile clutch as well. I'm telling you, man, when you drive kind of these beefy cars from the 80s, they don't disappoint. I mean, is it gonna feel like a modern thing? No, but you're gonna see where all that came from and it makes a lot of sense. at home on the highway we're in fourth gear so let's hit the overdrive with a big thunk we just dropped a thousand rpm cruising at 2000 rpm barely in boost but you can tell if i give it just a little bit of throttle that starts to build up a little bit so you know it's up to you how much fuel you want to drink i guess oh fast grand cherokee coming up it tracks super straight. This is an easy car to drive on the highway. You could do a lot of miles. If you want to do like rallies and like a cool 80s Americana vibe, this would be the thing to take because it'll it'll do the speed. I mean, you could definitely hold, you know, 150, 160 miles an hour. Not that you ever would, but you could. a lot of sports cars at the time I mean I guess 911s but you have a lot of visibility because you've got all glass in the back this is really nice to drive on the highway Boston City skyline ahead, not a bad place to be. We've got this gentleman, looks like he wants to turn in. Feel free, dude. Off goes the overdrive. Oh, God. I think the one downside to these old muscle cars is just the gearing. And I, you know, this one's an odd case because we've got the four plus three, but it is uh, tricky because this car, especially the, these old like lumpy American muscle cars, you can do a lot way down low. They've got a lot of low end torque. So when you go into a corner, you don't need to be like revving the nuts out of it. It's fine, it's happy, but you also need to keep it in boost. So there comes in the tricky thing is, do you keep the revs high to try to stay in boost? Or do you try to ride that low end torque from the big V8 and then let boost come in later? So I would need to spend some time with this car to really understand how to operate it under certain conditions. Look, I think I'll always love the C4 Corvette, not, not, not necessarily because I'm gonna run out and buy one, but because I was born in 88. This car is a birth year car for me. They used the C4 Corvette in 90210, Beverly Hills 90210. Was I old enough to really grasp that show? No, but I was old enough to see pieces of it come on television and then do big burnouts or you know chase scenes or whatever the heck they were doing on the show. And I loved it, I loved it. This is definitely a childhood poster car for me. And while I might not really want a standard C4, the value added when you have the Callaway twin turbo attached to it. 
that's where this starts to get good. And I gotta say, it's genuinely fun to drive in 2021. It's so wild how the boost builds in this thing. I'm sure there's plenty of you who know a lot more about these cars. You own these cars, you grew up with these cars, you've studied these cars. But you know, I just love driving everything. So while I may not be an expert on Callaway's interaction with Chevrolet back in the 80s, I can certainly appreciate driving it today in 2021. So I'm gonna go back and return this car to Garage 42 in Woburn, Massachusetts, the storage facility in which I keep my M5. And I'm gonna go decompress and think about how cool 80s American cars were. So thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Don't forget to respect the drive, and I'll see you in the next one. It's easy to drive around town, man. You can just dawdle along. No one's the wiser that you've got two turbos buried under this big V8, with a bunch of complex oiling systems to keep it from grenading itself. What's even cooler is the fact that it was built in Old Lyme, Connecticut. I mean, it's down the street. That's local. This is a local car. If I were GM, there's a couple choices I would have made differently. First is I would not have put the overdrive button on top of the gear selector because it's very easy to hit it while you're shifting. So you're going for third, you happen to touch the button, and now you're actually going for like third high. The other thing I would change is the location of the uh, seat buttons, the adjustments, because if you put anything in here, it's gonna start moving your seat. And um, I'm not gonna lie, that happened to me. I put my phone there, I leaned on it, and my seat started moving backwards, and I went, oh my God!